Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to DNews Plus again today for episode 4 of 4 from our trip to the LHC and CERN. It was amazing. So far we've talked to Talika Bose. She works on one of the experiments sitting on the LHC, so make sure you go back to episodes 2 and 3 to check out our conversation with her. If you don't know what an LHC is, also make sure you check out episode 1, because that's where we explain the Large Hadron Collider and what it does. Today, though, we're going to show you an interview that we had with Michael Lamont, who's the operations group leader at the LHC. Essentially, he's the guy at the top keeping everything running, making sure that everything is working so that the protons are delivered and the collisions happen at the experiments at the right time when they need it to happen consistently. It's a pretty incredible process, and this is what science looks like when you get it out into the real world and off the page. It's pretty incredible, so check it out. So where are we right now? What, what is this room for? Okay, we're in the CERN control center. And from here, we control the whole of the CERN accelerator complex. So behind us, we have the LHC island, where we have a team running the LHC. But the other islands around this room are dedicated to the pre-injectors, which provide the beam for the LHC. Okay. So. Uh when it comes to the controlling, is this like controlling the magnets, controlling the power input, everything? Is like this the heart of this is This is the heart, yeah, this is the heart. So we are, we're, uh, the, the, the LHC is, you know, it's a 27 kilometer ring, huge number of superconducting magnets with an awful lot of uh, parameters involved in the control and monitoring of this. And that all comes up here for, uh, for us to look after it and make sure that everything's okay. And so when things do go wrong, this is where the alarms will start? This is where screens go red and we, <laughs> people get really worried now. Yeah. And this, is, this has happened. Yeah, uh, we were talking to some people earlier, they said it's extremely complex and thus it's also very finicky. <laughs> finicky, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's remarkably how, how well it does work for being so finicky, in fact. I mean, we, this is our, we're into our sort of sixth year of operation now, so there's, a, you know, there's been a lot of consolidation of the finickiness, if you like. Yeah. And um, it, it, actually, it actually, when it's running, it actually runs quite well. Yeah, pretty smooth. Pretty smooth, yeah. Indeed. Great. So what does it look like when it's running? Like, what, how do you know it's going? It's very quiet in here. I it's would have thought, you know, like Star Trek, and you hear it. <laughs> something. <laughs> well, at the moment, we're, um, okay, okay, you see behind us, we're actually, we're flatlined at the moment. Oh no! Because we, we, have a, we have a series of injectors, and one of those, the proton synchrotron, this, is, this was, uh, first came online in 1959, so this really is an old machine, um, about 600 meters in circumference, and this is a key part of the acceleration chain okay. before the beams get to the LHC, and this has got, uh, had a fairly serious problem with its main power supply which went down at the end of last week. Mm -hmm. So they're just in the process of finishing, repairing that, and hopefully we'll get beam back later this afternoon. Oh, great, okay. So there are so many components. How do you keep track of everything, you know? Um, well, it's a, it's a very good question. I mean, what, what, what we do have is, is, is the, the, the different specialities are very compartmentalized. So we have a team looking after the vacuum, we have a team looking after the power supplies, we have a team looking after the beam instrumentation. And they, if you like, keep track of their own domain. And, and as it all comes together here, but we're relying on these teams out there to make sure that their, their kit is up, running, and uh, working well. So it's very much like a collaboration between lots and lots of people to keep just the science going. Absolutely, absolutely. And we, you know, we're running here 24 hours a day, seven days a week during our operation period. And, it, and when things go wrong, we, you know, we, we get out the phone book and we ring the experts in the middle of the night. They'll drive across the French countryside, go and fix the problem, and then we go again. Wow, that's crazy. So what are like some of the challenges working with such a complex and massive infrastructure? It's a sh sheer scale, in fact. I mean, if you, the, the 27 kilometers is just, this, this is just a huge amount of stuff that has to work at the, s the same time. Yeah. And, and this, you know, in the in the design, uh, the installation, and the, the maintenance of this, we've really got one eye on what we call machine availability. Just making sure that everything is working as well as it possibly can, and the mean time between failures is is an, is an acceptable level. So, if you like, the work is done before we start operating. Mm -hmm. If we get problems while we're running, we have to fix them. Mm -hmm. But if you like, the the just making the whole uh, ensemble 
come together is, is something that's you know has taken a lot of work beforehand. Yeah, yeah. Back in 2008, um, we were just commissioning the LHC with Beam for the first time. We'd actually put Beam on the 10th in the 10th of September. We'd actually circulated Beam in both uh, directions for the first time. Nine days later, we were just finishing off some powering tests. We had about 8,000 amps in the main magnets and uh, a short developed between the, um, in the interconnect between two magnets. This opened up, started arcing and caused a helium leak, which flooded helium into the uh, intermagnet space. And uh, we had a train wreck on our hands. Whoa. And then the screens really did go red. We didn't realize how serious it was until you know, the, the, the fire brigade went in. Um, but we had uh, hundreds of meters of magnets ripped off their jacks. I mean, these are 30 tons each, and they were kind of like this. Right, you can't uh, just like push them back. Uh, no, so uh, <laughs> so <laughs> so 50, it's about 50 odd magnets had to come out, be refurbished, Whoa. repaired, and we were off for over a year. So wow. that that's, uh, that's that's as serious as it's got so far. Right, I mean, there's so many different, I mean, I, I've said this already a bunch of times, I feel like it's getting old. There's just so many things happening, and there's so many things that have to go right. It's incredible that it runs at all, almost, from time to time. Yeah. So, uh, as, as, yeah, this, this really is, this is, is a very good point. I mean, what we have, okay, as this example shows us, we've got huge energies in the, um, in the magnets, we've got huge energies in the beam. Now, we can't monitor that on a, on a, with, by human interaction, so we have automatic systems out there, we have machine protection systems, which are continually surveying down there in the tunnel at the front end. If they see anything wrong, they or something comes over hot and bothered, they will dump the beam and close down the circuits safely. Wow. So everything's been set up that if any problem does develop, then it's not going to be somebody here pushing the button that's going to you know, stop, stop it getting worse. Right. It will be the safety systems down on, in the tunnel which will take care of it. So they would get a notification here that the safety system found a fault. Oh, absolutely. I mean, in this you, you see immediately, you, yeah. you know there's a problem. I mean, it's not, it's not like uh, this goes on you know, hidden away. There's, right. You know, again, <laughs> I mean, yeah, like there's a lot that you can see. There's, there's calm, red. calm, automated voice. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, have, we have automated voice. We have, we, have, we have a voice synthesizer. Red's, red's bad and green's good. Yeah. So, um, That's, yeah. That seems pretty universal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I've, I've been kind of like <laughs> worried about whether we should ask about it but I do want to know what happened with No, the I mean this is, this is this is this is fine. The, yeah. um, I mean the the weasel just to put this in context the uh, the screen's going red in 2008 took us out for a year. The weasel took us out for 6 days. Okay. So it's you know and um, it's a 66 kilovolt to 18 kilovolt transformer. So you have the 66 kV lines coming in, the 18 kV lines coming out. And the weasel had climbed up on top of the transformer and made a contact between Earth and one of the 18 kV uh, cables. Um, so How was the mass, I bet? The weasel didn't come out of it very well, yeah. as to be said, but the, an arc developed and um, it damaged the cables and some of the uh, connections for the 66 kV. But this is, this is, this was, it was a, in fact, it was a Soviet um, transformer. Whoa. Made, you know, back, made, made back in the USSR uh, in 91. Wow. And uh, so there was damage to the bushings and the cables. It was just and, getting and, old. And it, no, well, no, no, it was, and the, the transformer's fine. Oh. So just repair the cables, repair the bushings, and go again. Hmm. But you know, this is a kind of expert intervention by external companies, so you have to wait for them to come and do what right. they have to do right, and right. test it all out afterwards. Dang. I mean, what are some of the oldest components you have? I mean, newest, probably some this week, you know, they're just fixing things right now. But it's, uh, it's, it's um, the, uh, as I said, the, P the PS was, uh, came online first beam in 1959, mm -hmm. and there's still some original uh, st stuff from that era. Wow. There's, a, there's an important part of the main power system, the old main power system, which was running last week, which has got a plaque with um, 1967 on it. Wow. So there's, but this is big industrial stuff, mm -hmm. and this is designed. Yeah. You know, this is the stuff that drives our railways, drives you know, sitting outside skyscrapers. I mean, it's designed to mm -hmm. be very reliable and to last for a long time. And you know, so this is not particularly right. unusual. It's just you know. kind of amazing that, you know, it's it's science is about building and then building and then building. You're you're creating and then creating something on top of that and something on top of that. You know, it's never just oh, start 
with a blank piece of paper and draw some circles out. You know, it's like it's a it's a progression, the, which is I, awesome. Yeah, no, I think the, uh, sir, and this is this really is true. I mean, we've kind of got we've we've got a historic precedent here where we've we're, we're building, we're using the old accelerators still to this day to, in, in an important role, mm -hmm. and this has allowed us to kind of increase increase the scale of what we've uh, we can do and still keep the costs reasonable. Yeah. So when it comes to making sure collisions happen, you know, which is part of the deal, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just accelerating and, and re increasing in energy, it's also making sure that the, the beam comes in contact, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how do you guys ensure that that happens, or, or you know, up the probability at least? Okay, I, I mean, an important part, uh, that, okay, we've got two, two counter-rotating beams in, in the LHC, and the beam, if we look a bit closer, is actually made up of bunches and these bunches are about 30 centimetres long, um, typically about a millimetre di dimensions as they're going around the ring. And um, so think about a long, thin, tapered piece of spaghetti would be you know, spaced out uh, around more or less 26 kilometres. We fill the whole, our aim is to fill that 26 kilometres with these bunches, spaced by about seven metres or so, so they're kind of spaced out. Uh, we then, so we inject these bunches from the SPS, it takes about 20 minutes. We increase the energy of the whole lot, and so we ramp all our magnets and take the beam up to high energy. Um, and then, after a bit of messing around, we actually bring the beams into collision. So we start passing these bunches through each other in the centre of the big detectors and producing collisions. Okay, so this is the and uh, so we are we have very fine control with small corrector magnets which allow us to actually steer the beams into each other. So it's all, it's all done magnetically, There's it's not, all, nothing it's all, mechanical has to be moved in order to redirect anything anywhere. Absolutely, absolutely. We do have, we do have mechanical, some mechanical objects around the ring but uh, it, all beam control is done with, with magnets yeah. or with radio frequency to actually pump energy into the beam. Right. Um, wow. So you talk about increasing the collision rate. What can we do to actually maximise the um, the collision rate that we give to the experiments? This is really all they're interested in. Yeah. They're interested in collisions, collisions, collisions. And the target this year, just to put it in context, is about 800 million collisions a second. So we really kind of we have to work hard to get that rate. And one thing we do is actually reduce the beam size at the interaction point. So we take our, our pieces of spaghetti and focus them down with very strong quadrupole magnets, which act like lenses, to get them down to the diameter of a human hair as we pass them through, the, uh, through each other in the center of the ex experiments. Yeah, okay, so, so this is, you're so trying to make two hairs going very, very fast hit each other. Exactly, well they pass through each other. So, so we, in fact, the, the, each bunch has about 100 billion protons each. We pass these thin hairs through each other and we get about 30 collisions. So most of, the, most of the protons just miss each other and they carry on around the ring. They come back, late, come back one turn later and they can do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're, but the thing is we're going around the ring 11,000 times a second. We've got 2,000 odd bunches, 20 collisions a second and this gives us the, the, the hundreds of millions of collisions per second. Yeah, wow. Seems complicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah. It's, in fact, it's just numerics when it comes down to it. Right. But uh, it is. It, I mean, it is quite remarkable that we can actually, you know, we can mm -hmm. get these these very small beam sizes, and we can very accurately sort of, you know, yeah, get, get these you know, get these to meet inside the uh, experiments. Yeah. And ju and and just to say, we we when we start doing these collisions, we'll sit there with these with beams going around continually producing collisions for 10, 12. Uh, last, last week we had a 35 hour fill where we left the beams going around and so for 35 hours the these bunches are passing through each other producing collisions in the experiments wow. and so this is collider mode. Yeah, and 35 hours in a row, is that, does that look different than just a few hours at a time? Or, I mean, ideally you want to be running as long as possible, right? Your uptime. You, you, you do, it's very, it's very nice, but what happens is the number of protons in the uh, beam gradually goes down as you lose protons to collisions, to collisions. even so. So the number of, so the actual collision rate slowly drifts down as these 30, you know, as the hours pass. Yeah. So at a certain point it's, it's, it's more interesting to dump the beams and refill and go around the cycle again. Mm -hmm. 
So when you say dump the beams, where does the what it, what happens then? Where does the beam go? So uh, stuck out in the forest on the other side of the ring, we have what we call the beam dumps, and what we have is fast magnets, which uh, basically is, is if you like, it's uh, points on a railway. But okay, as an analogy, and we actually divert the beam down a 700 meter long tunnel onto a big block of graphite, mm. which is about 70 centimetres in diameter, a few metres long, which can safely absorb the very high energies in the beam. So we have two of these for counter-rotating and clockwise beams and just, right. you know, kick them out onto the dumps. Wow, cool. And then what happens at that point? It's absorbed into the graphite and it just kind of... That's it. You, just, you generate, it. You generate, you, you generate a you bit could, of heat. Um, yeah. Does it fill it up eventually or is it radiated or anything like that? It's just kind of... That's that. It's, We're good. That's, that's that. It gets, I mean, the dump gets a bit radioactive. I mean, this is something right, you, yeah. don't, you don't want to be standing next to it when it happens. Right. But, uh, but not for very long, hopefully. <laughs> not for very long. And it is, is, this is contained within sort of tons of concrete and, ste right. and uh, steel to keep it all nicely, safely uh, tucked away. Wow. And then you just fill it up again and process it. That's, that's right. Over. We bring the magnets down to their injection level, take beam from the SPS and go through that loop again. Wow. How much like gas is running through the LHC at any given moment in terms of the volume that you're putting in there. Of, of protons or? Yeah, of protons, like coming out of that hydrogen tank. The high, I mean, on, on a good day, we'll have something like two, 10 to the 14 protons in the beam of that order, shall we say. Yeah. Now you think one gram of hydrogen has six times 10 to the 23 protons, so right. Avogadro's number. Yeah. So, the, so the, the number of protons we're talking about is really minimal. Right. So this is this is really a very, very, you know, um, in a terms of mass. Amount. A tiny amount. Very tiny uh, In amount. terms of our scale of things. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, so, so that bo little bottle of hydrogen gas lasts a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Great, wow, that's so cool. How did you get interested in doing this? You've been here for, you said, 26 years. Yeah. So how did you get interested in working here? I, I, I studied physics uh, in, uh, back in England. Um, I was coming back from a climbing trip in the Alps when I bump, bumped into an American who was, uh, who was working in Geneva at the time. So, you know, I tried to get a job out here. <laughs> <laughs> and being American, she told me to go and knock on the CERN's door. And I said, ah. And here you are. And here I am. Wow. That's super cool. How does it feel to be part of kind of one of the rock stars of science? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God. <laughs> it, is, it, is a, it is a huge privilege to be, to be working here, to be part of this, uh, you know, this adventure. Um, it, but it's hard work keeping this lot going. It really is. Um, and you know, everyone, Everyone's working hard to deliver the best physics they can to the experiments. And we really... We don't. We forget that we're rock stars, you know, yeah. or don't even consider that we could be rock stars. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for taking yeah, the time. Uh, my pleasure. I, hopefully, your beam comes back up soon. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're looking over there for the uh, the little blips on the, that fourth screen in. But, All right, uh, I'll keep an eye on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I hope you enjoyed these conversations with these two incredibly different and yet both super interesting people who work at CERN. If you think that we should go to some other experiments and see some other things around the world, some other big science projects, make sure you let us know in the comments because I want to go visit other places. Let us know also if you like us visiting other places because maybe you don't want me to go visit other places. I'm happy to sit here and talk to you about stuff as well. But let us know in the comments. Make sure you subscribe so you get more DNews Plus. Thanks so much for tuning in. Come find the show over on Twitter. You can find us at DNews. You can also tweet at me with the hashtag DNews Plus. If you have any questions about this or any of our other episodes, you can check out an episode right here on the screen. If you haven't seen one of our old episodes, we've got that up here for you. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm at Trace Dominguez on Twitter. We'll see you next time.